Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special bonus episode. And uh, for today's bonus episode about preparing companies for growth, we have joining us from uh, the US and California, Bao Tran. Hey, Bao, welcome to the show. Hello. Glad to be here. So Bao is a tech entrepreneur uh, with a focus on AI, blockchain, and other digital twin technologies. He is the founder and CEO of Power Patent Inc., where he innovates the patent process through automation. And he's also the co-founder of Aspire Health, which leverages tech in healthcare. Uh, Bao is also an angel investor at TVC and represents Silicon Valley at the Boston Global Forum. He holds a JD, MBA and BSE from top institutions. So uh, Bao, that was a short intro. Um, let's explore a little bit your entrepreneur journey, which I think will be of immense value for our journey because you have been directly related to product development organizations and developed products yourself started companies in the tech space. So tell us a little bit more about your journey into the world of technology and entrepreneurship. What, what was one or a few transformative moments for you in that journey? Uh, well, hi, Vasco. I'd like to get started by uh, thanking you for inviting uh, me to be at this. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as my background, it, it's uh, pretty eclectic. I started out as an electrical engineering student and then i decided to i wanted to add uh, an mba background in new york so then i went to columbia uh for that i thought i was going to go into investment banking uh but then um you know my, my mother had a stroke in houston and i decided to go back and uh then i had some extra time so i added a law degree uh i thought i was going to be in corporate finance but then the people look at my technical background and they said oh nope you got to be in patents and uh, so I uh, I started out working with patenting the uh, compact, uh, they call it the lunchbox. If you remember back then, they had these laptops the size of a lunchbox. So we patented that technology. We patented the early ProLiant server technologies for compact, which then became HP, of course. Um, I like nature and hiking. So I even, eventually I found my way to California, to Silicon Valley. Uh, with a big law firm called Fish and Richardson. And we worked on uh, applied materials, uh, Adobe software patenting, and with a lot, with a few startups. Uh, it's a big company, so most startups, uh, they really can't afford uh, big law firms. But uh, there was one company called uh, Align Technology. Uh, they make the Invisalign uh, orthodontic product where they scan your teeth and then they make these uh, 3D printed retainers they are fat, they are um, a cat fabricated so that they apply pressure to your teeth over time and they move your teeth uh, without the need for a brace. And, uh, you know, I thought that was a pretty neat product. So um, at the time, most of my friend joined, uh, you know, dot com companies in the year 2000 and uh, they were all doing IPOs left and right and uh, they were all doing well at the time. So I thought, well, let me roll my dice and uh, join the company because the founder liked me and they, he invited me to come on and architect the patent portfolio. So uh, I took the plunge, not realizing that everybody else was going after the dot com and I'm the only one going after the medical device. But of course, very soon after that, about a year after that, the entire dot com industry space collapsed. And uh, pretty much um, in, uh, Align Technology was the only company that was actually raising funding and keep on going and eventually it went public. Um, I, it was pretty rapid, of uh, course. Uh, I think I joined them in December 1999, and by 2001, they went public. Amazing. So uh, it was an amazing trip, and I was very privileged to be with those, uh, you know, the founder. And, of course, um, although Invisalign is a medical device company, it, it has a lot of software technology in there. Imagine you got to scan your teeth. You take that data. You have to have uh, convert that into a CAD model, right? So you got all these point uh, clouds data and then you got to convert that into 3d shape and then they have to have software to then automate the movement of teeth stage by stage 
So, uh, you know, you can go to Align uh, uh, now and you'll see how those computer-aided technology, um, uh, you know, what would have 20 years ago was actually. Uh, and then subsequent to that, then we have to solve the problem of how do you scan the teeth in a way that's, that's inexpensive. So we pioneered the use of um, uh, x-ray scanners into, uh, you know, portable dental uh, scanning of your teeth. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have to deal with... Um, uh, once you have that, how do you manufacture the stages? So there was software involved in mapping the 3D model into uh, a 3D printed. Uh, so um, as you were going through through that journey, which I, I I bet it must have been quite a roller coaster, especially when you saw companies around you kind of collapse and you were like, I'm sure in doubt. But eventually, everything ended up uh, uh, good for that company and, and eventually went public, as you said, as you were going through that journey, what are some of the things when you look back, you think, okay, people getting into this tech space and especially people that, you know, want to maybe start products or, or develop new ideas. What, what were the key lessons you took from that time that you think people wanting to enter in the tech space and growing valuable companies could apply these days? Well, I think, uh, you know, from a business side of it, uh, you need to have a product that has traction, and that's what investors look for. Um, so, um, you know, I was lucky to join uh, a company that that uh, was a fast-growing company. Uh, the other, you know, so so from a business side, that's important, but I think uh, I, I like to add some value uh, on top of that by putting in what I've seen so second you need is is very good people. People can that can develop software fast and quick. Uh, so quick uh, iterations, quick fail. You see a lot of um, uh, concepts that that uh, you know they tried it and they said, oh, this is not going to work. Let's go this way. And so quick iterations. And then um, you know, last but not least, you need to think about how do you maintain your exclusivity because if you've done all the hard work in creating in doing all these iterations and the pivots and you finally found a solution that uh, that the the market likes uh it would be, be terrible if somebody else comes in and just simply swipe the ideas from you and that's one thing that criticism that I have of Kickstarter if you go into Kickstarter and you just you know sp spill your gut show everything you have and then let the world vote uh, by by buying your product uh, you know, imagine if you're a competitor, all you have to do is just look at it on Kickstarter to see which company succeeded in funding, and they already told you what they're going to do. So all you do is you look at the, the success, and then boom, you copy them and you move quicker from them. So that's called the uh, second to market uh, type of strategy, where you look for somebody who is successful, and then you copy them very quickly. And then that way, you've learned from all their experience, and you've gained all that time, right? So what's the solution for this? The solution is you need to do IP protection before you list it on, you make your, your go-to-market plans, uh, you publicize it, right? So uh, before you go to, let's say, Kickstarter, you patent it. And so that way, uh, uh, you know, you're protected, right? And But, but uh, what, when you think about the, the process of developing the technology now, not, not considering the, the Kickstarter uh, point, which we will come back shortly, but uh, when you're preparing the, the company, I mean, I, I'm just thinking like, okay, you said uh, you need to have a product that has traction. So like it's important to even define what does that mean for my product and how, how do you measure that? Uh, uh, what are we looking for? How do we create that traction? And then you also mentioned but you need also good people that are able to iterate quickly because very likely if you're especially if you're in a new space the first attempts will not necessarily create that traction so what do you take from that experience when it comes to structuring the team and and rapidly growing through the product and of course also through other means uh, a company to to ensure that you know you don't get maybe too uh, uh, attached to the first initial ideas that can happen as well, right? Like that you are able to iterate and fail fast, as you mentioned. What are some of those experiences that you can share with our audience? Well, I think one of the beauty that Silicon Valley has is that it's really global. It's not so much um, California or it's not US. We have people from all over the world here. You know, we had uh, Palestinians working well with uh, you know, with the Israeli people here. It's amazing. You don't see any of that conflict in Silicon Valley. We're focused on 
solving a problem. So, and the beauty of it is that we attract the best of the best. So that means uh, there's an abundance of, of of talent that you can tap into. Uh, so we're lucky there. But I'm but but I think since since um, you know for 20 years now, we you see development centers are popping out all over the world. So they've replicated the 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 the, the success that Silicon Valley had. But I think it, you know because it's a, the world is a global stage. What I, I would recommend is that you have a core team that is close to you so that you can quickly communicate. But you also recruit people from other countries because they add diversity. They add viewpoints that, you know, you're, let's say, um, you know, in Helsinki, you may not have the, um, uh, the, 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 the customer experience of somebody in China or somebody in maybe... Um, uh, Kenya. So so I think you need to have a core team that's really top-notch, and then that recruits some additional top-notch people from different parts of the world because they give you the perspective. And 20 years ago, that was difficult, but now with the advent of Zoom and internet, it's very, very easy now for you to communicate your point across. Uh, and so I think the key is You've got to find uh, the top people in the space and recruit them and uh, give them, uh, be inclusive so that they feel that they're part of the team. They share in the vision, they share in the rewards, uh, and then they add, and then you know uh, make sure that you learn from their perspective because uh, it adds diversity. I think diversity is is a um, uh, is something that maybe perhaps uh, in the in the rush to market we 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 miss that that, that viewpoint. Yeah, this is actually a great point because we are just at uh, uh, what might be, we don't know yet, but what sounds and feels like an inflection point with the appearance of uh, large and commercially viable large language models. Uh, and and we, we are talking about the need to have diversity in order to be able to understand how the product could work and uh, also how to adapt the product to different geographies, right? Like this uh, product category, the the large language models, they, they are growing so fast and getting so fast adoption all over the world that uh, <laughs> even the topic of diversity has become a problem for, <laughs> for that type of products. Um, yes, well, I noticed the Google's recent problem of trying to be overly diverse, right? Yeah, that, there's all kinds of uh, potential problems, especially because LLMs are now being treated as almost as if they were another human, right? So we are putting, we are projecting onto the output of LLMs the same rules we project onto, you know, a news out, uh, uh, outlet, <laughs> which is quite amazing that we are at that level of, of uh, let's say, parity in terms of ethical rules and so on. But it's also real, right? It's, it's there. Uh, but but I wanted to ask about something that you know you 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 work as a as a uh, uh, an angel investor and you've worked with many startups uh, in in your work. Um, so uh, of course you've talked a lot about how to build teams and and also how to prepare companies for growth. But I, I wanted to focus still a, a little bit on that idea of how to build teams. Uh, can you share what are some of the things you want to see in the companies that you work with and you support uh, with your investments when it comes to the approach to recruiting talent for tech focused companies? Yeah, so I think you need to have a balance between new people with fresh idea and uh, and people with experience, right? So uh, startups are typically younger generations who, let's say, have a new idea and they they throw it out and they test it. Uh, and so the idea may have traction; it may be very popular, but as you scale, you will need to have some. Uh, people with experience in making, uh, uh, you know, commercial grade software. So there, there's a fine line between a, a mix of that. And so I think uh, what you should be looking for is, um, you know, the, the the people with the idea are they, you know, the the, the best in their in 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 their particular uh, product space, right? Uh, and, and fortunately, you know, in our world, we have so many, um, you know, with the long tail approach to product development now, uh, you, you, mean, you don't need to be the best programmer. You just have to be the best person who uh, come, up, come up with that vision, right? And then in turn, you go and recruit other people from the, uh, the, uh, a software developer or, or, you know, a few software developer as uh, potentially your co-founders. Um, 
and uh, and then have them help you build a product. Now, along the journey, you're going to find some people will work out great and some people will not. So you need to plan for that in the, the in the in, in in advance. So what do you you know uh, what I recommend is you have some sort of a um, a vesting period where not all the stocks vest uh, up front, but you space them out over a four year period, and you have a, a a a time to evaluate how well that person works into the company, and uh, and at some point you know if if if, if there's a great fit, of course you you know it right. But if it's not a great fit, I'm a proponent of, um, you know, separation early. It's it's easier said than done. I myself, I, as we discussed earlier, I, I could not let go for over a year. Uh, but I think that you know, if you do it earlier, it'll be less painful for everybody to um, uh, to uh, to transition and move on. That the person that doesn't work out for your company may be perfect for another company. So you 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 know, so don't think of cutting loose as being a downside for everybody. You may be doing that person a favor, right? So you need to um, try to find the best that you can given your budget. And so typically, what is your budget for a startup? Well, for a startup, you don't have much, but you have the, the, the stock as a component. And so that's where the, the stock is the, is the main reward uh, and, and the vesting period, it would be good. And then you also need to make sure that the IP um, is is protected because uh, once you have a separation, people often turn um, non-cooperative. So what I would recommend is uh, you get the person come in, join the team, and work, and then develop the IP that you know uh, protect the IP that they're working on as early as possible. So you get that assignment done. And let's say maybe in six months or a year, you find out that for whatever reason. Um, you know, uh, they are not working out. Uh, you have that IP already locked up, and you don't have to go in and 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 into a protracted uh, uh, negotiation yeah, of whether exactly. or not they're going to sign it. Yes. So, so when it comes to this idea, I mean, of of course, I'm sure most people listening to this would be familiar with NDAs or non-disclosure agreements. But but when you when you think about employees who will be quite very much you know, deep into the product development. What does protect your IP mean in that context? Well, so um, uh, I'll give you a quick overview of the, the different aspects of IP that you can consider. So uh, you have copyright that covers your website, your music, uh, you know, your videos whatsoever, right? And that's normally pretty easy to get. You have trademarks that protect your branding. Uh, you know, how you name your products uh, and, and how you identify that. And that's also fairly straightforward. You have trade secrets. So, for example, in AI, how you train your learning machine, that's not patentable. But you may have some special recipes on how you uh, process, pre-process the data, how you uh, sequence the data for training. And so those things should be uh, kept as a trade secret. Uh, trade secrets also cover your uh, customer list and things like that. So that's a component. And that's uh, you know, when you mentioned NDA, that is where the NDA ties into the trade secret. Now, one problem with a trade secret is that these days, uh, employees are mobile, right? So you have a com uh, an employee that might work for you for two or three years, and then they just jump off and work somewhere else. Now, if you rely purely on trade secret, and if that secret is in their head, they can't undo it. It's there in their head. Right? They, and I think in the U.S., uh, and I'm pretty sure in Europe, a person is entitled to use what's in their head. Uh, they, they can't you know, purposely copy your customer list, but if they know generally that, hey, uh, uh, this is a customer type, you can't stop them from using what's in their brain. right? So the way you protect your IP is in patenting. And so when if you have a patent, uh, regardless of whether or not somebody carries it in their head or not, they cannot practice that particular patented method, number one. Number two is a lot of founders make the mistake that, oh, patents are expensive and I really want to take all my money and pour it into software engineering. Well, uh, it, it is, an, ex it is a, an item you got to pay for, but think of it as an asset because for a found, I found out that a lot of founders have this mistaken belief that, uh, oh, that's just paying 10000 to file a patent application and they'll, they'll, and they'll never see anything coming back out of it. That's not true. When you have a patent application, you can go and tell your investors that, hey, I have a patented concept and that patent there is worth at least 
150,000, $200,000 because it's protecting the concept, so, right? So th that's actually a good point. So as, as a, uh, also an investor yourself, uh, what, are, what are some questions you ask the companies to assess if they are, uh, if they have actually uh, IP that may be worth patenting and therefore also create value, create an asset for the company, as you said? Well, the first thing I do is I go in and I say, what is your, your product? And what is it that you don't want your competitors to be able to say about the features of that product, right? So we have a feature list that's important, right? Once we have a targeted feature list, what we do is then we say, well, tell me how does your, your software or, you know, or, or, or in case of a mechanical system, how does a system perform and provide this feature? They will give me, oh, yeah, you know, we do it this way and this way and this way. And then I'll ask, okay, give me the diagrams for that, right? And so once you have the diagram and a high-level description of how it works, that's the fundamental basis of a patent application. Now, then it comes down to a matter of cost. How do you, you know, if you have Series A funding and you don't have time, sure, you pay a big law firm to do this. Now, if you don't have money and you're a scrappy uh, seed stage founder, how do you do this without, you know, burning your bank? Uh, one way to consider is to use technology itself. So Power Patent, as you mentioned, is one company that I work, uh, that I'm a founder of. And what we do is we take that information, the, the drawings and the basic description of how it works. We use AI to then spin out a, an, uh, a patent application that is, uh, you know, almost we call it ready for filing, but we don't recommend that you file with that. We recommend that you take that and then you find a lawyer who can work, who who would be willing to work with you, and they will say, "Hey, look, I've already drafted most of the application, and even though I think it's ninety percent done, I'll say sixty percent done. Could you take this and add your value and review to it, uh, and review the the document and add your value to it and bill me half price? Instantly, so, you save money there. So w that is very interesting, uh, especially the first step, because you were thinking, okay, so we need this kind of information, like you, you talked about diagrams, feature lists, and so on, that you can feed into Power Patent. But but uh, what, I, what I'm thinking is, okay, so there's, let's say there's product owners listening to us right now, and they're thinking, so one way in which I can add value to my company is by finding, right, like either creating or finding things that are worth patenting and and that that question has two sides which is of course first what do i have that i could patent and also what are things worth patenting in general in my product category or pro, or, or business vertical so from those two questions perspective like how do you advise the startups that you work with to find those assets those valuable items that you can then patent so um, there are two routes to do this. The first is I think you need a, a foundation of your protecting your products first, because most people, most founders are not really interested in patenting for the sake of, of uh, 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 valuing the company based on the patent. They're interested in protecting their go-to-market strategy. So uh, in that first approach, uh, we use that strategy that we, uh, that we just mentioned, which is identify the product features that you think uh, is unique. And those are the features that you tell your investors as this is how we're differentiated from the com competition, right? So lay that foundation. That's step number one. Step number two is uh, to the extent you have the luxury of time, you look at your competitor and you think, huh, now if I am successful and they want to ape me, how would they morph their products to offer some of my features? And so you might want to, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of envision a future where other people, you're so successful that other people may want to adapt their product into yours. So how would they design around your product to offer the same feature, right? So that's layer two is to anticipate the competition, how they would avoid your own patent uh, by designing around it, right? So instead of uh, they design, design around your own patent, you would design around your own patent and patent that. That's number two. And then step number three is for companies with more resources, uh, somebody dedicated to, let's say, an in-house attorney. They might sit down and they think, well, okay, we have these um, uh, assets you know, in the portfolio. How could we license 
people not in our own industry, but in other industry, to use this technology in their own space, right? So i.e. you expand your original invention to future uses. So uh, I'll, I'll name you, let, let's say, give you an example. Um, uh, let's say uh, uh, the, the um, uh, you, may have, uh, you may have invented some sort of a solar charger and that might have originally been used for, let's say, uh, a car. But now that solar technology, because it's lightweight and it's high efficiency, it might be able to use it in, let's say, in a laptop, on the back of a, a laptop, so that the laptop could be a solar recharged and you, and you don't have to constantly plug it in. So you can play, you know, you can take your technology because you know it quite well and see how it might fit in other industry. And then you would patent that and then you would approach those companies to license them. So that's free revenue for you. Right. Although it's not in your, you know, your strategic focus of what products you're going to be serving, you still can monetize the technology for use by non-competitor, which is perfect. You'll make more money that way. So, so uh, f from those companies you've invested in, what what are some examples that you've seen of? And and uh, I I would take first the identify product features that you think are unique and lay the foundation that aspect were, were some of the most impressive uh, uh outcomes of that that you've seen yeah this this particular company was able to actually do a, a really good work of assessing their product and what they thought was unique and they really laid a great foundation for 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 growth as well right sure so uh we have a company called micronoc inc and what they do is they uh, put in uh, these uh, battery banks into mid-sized, small and mid-sized businesses. And, uh, and the objective of that was to uh, average out the, uh, the energy consumption when they power up during the, the, during the start of the day. Uh, because in, out here in California, we basically have a particular pricing mechanism where they price based on expectation, based on your your um, highest uh, surge, because they figure that you're going to continue on using that surge, so they're going to reserve the energy for you for that surge, right? But yeah. as you know, a surge is just temporary, five, 10 minutes during startup. And if you're paying for that elevated cost all, over, all the time, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's um, a waste of money. Right. So what this company does is uh, they put in battery back up into a, a big, you know, uh, it's like a, a cabinet size uh, battery and it, it buffers the energy consumptions uh, during the start of the day. Uh, and then during the rest of the day, it'll just sit there and be lightly be charged. Right. So we patented that particular uh, uh, structure of cost saving. But then you take that and you go to level two when you think, well, Imagine if you have in a city a thousand of these businesses that have these uh, distributed battery banks. What can you do with it? Guess what are they doing? They they basically you know, talk to those businesses and they say, "Hey, we want the ability to reverse the power flow from powering your business back into the grid." And that is the uh, and that's how they they arrive at the concept of what is called a virtual utility. Mm -hmm. Because now you got a thousand battery bank that you can on demand. Let's say if you have some sort of a, a circuit brownout uh, on demand, those thousand batteries can now be charged back into the grid, right? And, and if you battery. think about it, like the the these ideas these days are so easy. I mean, quote unquote easy to implement because most of these battery modules are fully software operated. Exactly. So, you know, software ate the world as they say it, right? So now, <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, to me, I, my guess is over 50% of the world's product is somehow touched by software. So, so you know, the software space, uh, the founders that you're serving, uh, they're doing a very important uh, thing. And, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. Um, the uh, We were talking about how, what are the ancillary uses of power patent? And I talked to another investor, and they were thinking of doing a um, uh, a seed investment company where uh, instead of just investing money, they're going to invest in uh, also into uh, they're going to provide a technological stack available for their founders to use. Mm -hmm. 
And part of that technological stack is to utilize the power patent as a front end. So you, you know, when you join this, um, the, the, this, if you are a company that's invested in by this company, you will have access to cheap patenting capability. Um, they're going to use AI to help you generate the um, the pitch deck uh, and things and and business plan and things like that. So and then they're going to have a network of. Uh, people who produce for you. So for example, you might have consultants, uh, software consultants. So you may have Alibaba doing the production for you and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think software- so I, I think the easy. kind of, we, we just touched a little bit of the surface and uh, I, I'm aware of that. And, and I think that would be quite a lot of space to, to uh, dive deeper into this topic. Uh, for those that are interested and want to maybe you know read a little bit more understand how they could bring these ideas to their business and their products and get the value out of it that you just described uh, what's one resource it could be a book a, a youtube video a blog post or even a, a blog itself that you could recommend for our listeners to go in and learn a little bit more about the topic uh yes we have right now a small youtube channel uh, uh called power patent uh, and uh, we, uh, but we're, we're uh, you know, we're recording over a hundred videos on different aspects of, you know, um, patenting and how does that relate to go-to-market strategies and uh, uh, also, um, you know, views on, on uh, uh, you know, the, the, the founder team and views on fundraising and things like that. So, yes, um, you can uh, visit the Power Patent the YouTube channel. Uh, and then we also have, um, because of my background as a patent lawyer, I also run a small uh, patent law firm practice. And we also have a, a pretty rich um, a set of a video channel at, uh, at Patent PC. So uh, you can visit patent, patentpc.com. So that's the law firm that we, um, we do patent services there. Uh, Absolutely. So we'll put the link to those on the show notes and Bao, for those that want to get in touch and maybe ask a few follow-up questions after this episode, uh, where can they find out more about you and the work that you're doing? Uh, yes, excellent. So they can reach out to me at btran at powerpatent.com. So B-T-R-A-N at powerpatent.com. Absolutely. Yes, we'll I'm put that on the, on the show notes so that people can easily find and, and get in touch. Uh, Bao, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Thank you, Vasco, for inviting me to uh, your show. And uh, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, visit and, uh, and, and see you in person in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Absolutely. <laughs> we really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.